Welcome to the first episode of Cut It Out. I am your host, The Red Wizard. With this podcast, I will be speaking with my most favorite collage artists, paper crafters, and other makers from all around the globe. In this episode, I interview Max Malone. He is a professional collage artist and graphic designer based in Australia. In this episode, Max explains how he got his brand deal with Bombay Sapphire Gin, how he decorated an entire music venue with collage materials, and how to get the most out of scanning your assets and collages. We also talk a little bit about setting up a drop shipping store. Ladies and gentlemen, there are so many things that you could be listening to or scrolling with your thumb right now on your phone. I want to genuinely thank you for listening to this podcast. If you enjoy it, please subscribe. If you'd like to help support the podcast, if you're going to be making collages or art anyway, you could go to my Amazon affiliate store at redwizardcollage.com. If you buy a pair of scissors or some glue or some paper, Jeff Bezos himself will sprinkle seven cents on my corpse. I also have prints and free collage kits available at my store if you're interested in getting into the hobby or you'd like to buy some funky stuff to decorate your walls with. Thank you so much for joining this collage conversation. Let's get into it. Well, thank you so much for being here. This is the first ever episode of Cut It Out. Now you went surfing oh, yeah. yesterday? Yeah, um, and I'm gonna go after this as well. I'm, <laughs> I'm terrible, but um, I can stand up now. So yeah, it's, a, it's an improvement from a month ago. And so you're from West Australia. Well, I'm actually originally from the UK, but um, I moved out here to be with my partner and we've been here five years now. Normally based in Melbourne, that's where I call home now. Okay. But ever since uh, the pandemic, we, um, we kind of fled the city and we're now in rural Western Australia, about five hours north of Perth. And this room that we're recording in is a studio that my partner and I built about six years ago. So this is a a separate room at the back of the house and this is where we work day to day that's awesome yeah i was wondering i've seen pictures of your studio on instagram and i'm like wow that looks like an awesome place to work and i actually assumed that you were in some kind of artist collective or something like that maybe mm -hmm. like an industrial building that um, a bunch of artists uh, worked in but that's totally your own yeah. spot, huh? well it, you did have that exactly right i was in the most amazing uh collective this uh space in in brunswick in uh in melbourne and i shared a i shared a studio room with another collage artist a guy called harry madden so that's probably what led to the pictures looking as impressive as they were because it was the collection of, of both of our hoardings of books magazines and papers and cabinets and curiosities so just for, in terms of photo shoots, it just meant that it just had that extra wow factor with, you know, merging both of our belongings. Because it very much was kind of a few of his things here, a few of mine there. It wasn't kind of half and half. It really kind of mixed and merged. And it was a really cool time. And, um, yeah, I'd, I'd still be there today if it wasn't for the pandemic. But um, mm -hmm. a, number, a number of things kind of happened, including uh, the building getting... Uh, demolished for for renovations and being turned into apartments so our time in that space was up anyway yeah, that'll that'll do it if they're demolished yeah. you can't really stay there can you yeah so for now all of my collage materials and accessories and everything that's all in storage so everything that you see here everything that i'm working with here is the stuff that i've collected and amassed only since about uh may last year so I've okay. kind of amassed a whole, a whole new, you know, studio and about three or four bookshelves of materials all just over the last eight months, nine months. And eventually I'll be taking this back to Melbourne to join my, my other studio. And eventually I'll be combining that with a lot of possessions that I left behind when I left the UK. So I've still got quite a lockup of of materials as well in the UK. You have a stash in the UK still of collaging materials? Yes. Yeah, I've got so quite a lot there. That the question, how, well, where do you like to get your collage materials and, and how much time do you spend uh, hunting for uh, these? It's, uh, 
uh, daily I'll check marketplace, you know, within a 20 kilometer radius. Um, just last week I picked up, oh, I don't know how many, but maybe a hundred National Geographic magazines, some as early as the fifties. Nice. So, uh, you know, I've, I've got, you know, hundreds and hundreds of those here. So that's a, a week, a daily thing is checking marketplace. Um, and then it's weekly to, um, Facebook marketplace. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And then op shops, I go to op shops, uh, nearly every other day. I'm kind of I'm fortunate enough now that we're in WA where we don't have a lockdown. So I just have to sign in when you enter places and yeah. So thrift stores, whatever you call them, we call them op shops or back in the UK, they used to be charity shops. Yeah. We call them thrift stores here. Yeah. Yeah. And then finally, I love, I love, love, love going to the tip. So the tip has a, the tips are dumped. Oh, really? They let you in there? Well, it's, you can't just go sort of rummaging through the debris, which oh. I would actually love to do, but there's a, there's a separate building adjacent to the tip where people can drop off and donate things instead of just throwing it into landfill. So I really love going there for the fact that I'm kind of most of the time rescuing thing, things that would otherwise just be getting buried in the ground. That's fantastic that's that's a lot of time that's a lot of checking that's, that's yeah i mean it's 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 my full time it's my full time gig these days so you know, I I take it seriously. are you a full time artist yeah. so you are a full time well, artist it, it it does it does vary so i graduated from graphic design back in 2015 okay and since since then i've been freelancing job to job but at the same time I've also found myself driving a combine harvester for a couple of months or working in, working in a bar. Uh, so it kind of varies, but since COVID I've been full time just on, just on my art game. And, uh, before that I had a good spell of about 18 months just doing my freelance thing and then going back to maybe doing one or two shifts in a bar a week, which, you know, I don't, I don't feel is a, a regression or, Sure. You know, so there's, there's certain occasions where I've kind of felt like I've, I've failed if I'm having to go back to finding part-time employment. Mm -hmm. But um, the way I try to look at it these days is that, you know, I just got to give myself a pat on the back that I still have people knocking on my door and wanting to work with me. So yeah, if, I have, have to do so if I have to do something on the side, then but at the moment it's my full-time thing. But that may change. Speaking of your work, that's one of the reasons why I really wanted to have you on here. You've done a lot of really cool stuff. And um, I feel like oftentimes when people think of collage, at least here in the States, people think of scrapbooking or junk journaling, and they don't typically think of it as this awesome art form, you know, that could do a lot of different things. And the first piece of yours that uh, really struck me was, I thought it was your Strawberry Fields um, mural, but it was a different music festival. Uh, you were, there's like a picture of you were on the beach and you had like a, like a, like a volleyball or something. There's like, was it like a mural that you did on the beach? There was, a, was it a music festival? Yeah, so there's, um, there's two festivals where I've created some uh, murals for. So uh, two, two in Australia, one back in the UK a few years ago. But um, there's Rainbow Serpent Festival in Rainbow Victoria. Serpent. Yes. Super vibrant so, um, outdoor mural. Yeah, really vibrant. I kind of just had a lot of fun creating that for a site specific site. And then on the back of that, I sent some photos of, 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 of that creation to um, Strawberry Fields Festival and said I'd love to love to come along there and they loved the example and they said, yeah, sure, come along. So they gave me a small budget, a few tickets. And um, that that was probably the more impressive one that you've seen. That was a uh, 12 meters by two. Whereas the uh, wow. the original rain, rainbow one was only, uh, I think, four by two. So the, the other one was way more of a landscape kind of panoramic piece. Was it covering um, both, up fence or something? What was the strawberry fields one covering up? And um, yeah, it, it was it was a part it was a partition between you know separating kind of backstage to kind of where patrons and, and 
festival goers can kind of roam around. So it was just a partition. Um, I mean, I'd love to have said it was on like the main stage or kind of something like that, but you know, one day. It was it was beautiful, man. And um, what's what what I was wondering too about it was it was outdoors. So when I when I was looking at the picture, you have this massive mural at a festival, and uh, you hit the nail on the head with the festival vibe. You know, there was like a storybook character kind of lounging with these sleepy eyes, right? Um, I was wondering, like, what kind of material was that made out of? Was it like a like a printed vinyl, like uh, stuck to a wall? So yeah, if you if if the budget's big and it and it needs to last, you know, multiple years, and it's then you would go for an exterior vinyl. Mm -hmm. However, in that case, with the budget I had, the intention was that it's it's got to last the the long weekend, and then after that, it's going to be um, packed down and put in storage. So. The kind of budget dictated the material, so it was just as cheap as you go. Uh, office office printing in A3 tiles on great like 80, 80 100 GSM paper. Did, did and you, you just prayed that there wouldn't be any rain, or did you know there was going to be absolutely no rain in Australia <laughs> during that time? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're talking like fucking hot, hot weather around yeah. that time of year, so. I mean, there might be crazy strong winds, but we were lucky enough here yeah, that there was no s scheduled rain. But actually, no. Looking back, it did, it did, it did piss it down on the Sunday. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I know every music festival has its own different vibe, but I love going to music festivals in the states. So what are the, what is like the Strawberry Fields vibe? What's what are the music festivals like in Australia? Oh uh, well. There's this term, term that they use out here in Australia called a bush duff. Have you heard a of a bush, bush duff? Duff? A bush duff. So I don't know if the, these, there will be hardcore bush duff enthusiasts which will be telling me, no, that's not a bush duff or it is a bush duff. But what, what, you're asking me what, what the vibe is of, of an yeah, Australian so, music person? Yeah. Oh, it's, it's they, 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 they party and they can, they go for it you know, a hundred, a hundred percent, like That's compared good. to how, how, how we do things in the UK where you pack a backpack in your cute little tent and you walk a few miles to pitch is the total opposite to how things are done in Australia. And it, it might be more similar to America, which is you turn up in your big four wheel drive, you've got your generators, your big eskies, your big cool boxes. Ah. You come with, you come with like all this mighty gear, and they also come with like these like trolley carts, which they'll load up with an esky and a boom box and like lighters strapped to it and a big a big flag so people can kind of keep with their tribe. Sure. sure. They'll have like you know, laughing gas dispensers taped to the sides and everything. Just like they'll be it's kind of a bit Mad Max-ish. <laughs> it's, it's the only way to describe it out there. It's like the outfits that they wear, they're all covered in kind of leather and belts and Cool. It's, it's, I mean, I've not ever been to Burning Man, but it's something between kind of hippies meeting Burning Man meeting kind of the Australian madness, which is just, I don't know, it's awesome. hard to describe, but if you, one day you've got to, got to come over and experience and the, it. And the so. occasional post apocalyptic cage match, right? Is that, <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Oh, I would gosh. say the, in upstate New York, where I'm from, the music festival vibe, you know, you have Woodstock was in upstate New York. Uh, it's not quite like that anymore. It's kind of like you have two camps of people. There are people that do come with their RVs and their generators and their flags, and they're they're comfortable. They're partying to the absolute yeah. max. But yeah, then there's like the other side of the campgrounds where it's like everybody who just bought their tent from walmart like a few days before and yes everyone just just tries to stay alive for three days and you know has oh, an I, <laughs> yeah that, that's actually that's actually giving me a few flashbacks to some of the kind of the culture of of it all that i don't really kind of rock with and that's that kind of throwaway you know one use tents like you say from walmart and just yeah. cheap gear that 
you know, it just ends up getting left behind. It does. It does. With a little hope, you know, like like some of the frat boys and stuff will they'll fall in love with it. Maybe their friend just told them to gum, and then next year they'll have a better tent. They'll have a grill, and um, so oh, I love music festivals so much. So when I saw your artwork at a music festival, I said, "Dude, I, I got to talk to Max. That's awesome." Now, I do have a surprise here, Max. Mm-hmm. I got my. Um, my $69 Valentine in the mail and I haven't opened it yet. So, Oh, that's so cool. So maybe as I open it, could you tell everybody what this, this deal okay. was? So, uh, late last year at the, at the, uh, tip shop, I found an entire suitcase outside of these romance novels with these cheesy covers. And I was wondering what to do with them. And then one day, you know, I was trying to pair them with something, you know, juxtapose them with something. And I had the idea to place a couple within a dessert. And I really loved the outcome, this kind of sexy couple having kind of syrup dripped over them. And it just really, really worked. So <laughs> I, had all these, I had all these cookbooks and I had all these romance novels. So I started trying to pair them together. And uh, before long, I had about 50 or so. Um, at the time... I was just sitting on them because I didn't really kind of have the time to, you know, fully um, share them or even have a physical place to exhibit them. So I just sat on them. And then earlier this year, I thought, you know, this would be a great series to, you know, tag along with with the commercial Valentine's season holiday. So So I had the idea that this is the ah, great ring. (laughs) So I wonder, you don't remember what the book title was with these two lovebirds was? <laughs> Do you remember? Oh, what? There's, there's, too, there's too many to know, but um, to, I think I came up with some name. I had all these names. Uh-huh. But to me, that's like some kind of ice cold seduction or whatever. But if you really, ah, look, if yeah. you really, if you really look at that, I feel like the bloke is actually looking beyond her at the ice cream. Totally. That's kind of... As he should, yes. This is fantastic. Yeah. But um, yeah, I wanted to create a, a system where I could um, sell some originals for a really affordable price. Because uh, I'm often asked, people want to buy something that isn't just a print. So, you know, they didn't take too long to make. A lot of the time was trying to get the colors to match or the angles and the shadows. So I had them all laid out and they came together relatively quickly. And then I thought, why not just be a bit fun and playful with it? Don't take it too seriously. A Valentine, sixty-nine dollars. A Valentine for sixty-nine. Awesome. Uh, all the pieces, sixty-nine dollars, including postage. However, my kind of concept was I'd love to get rid of all of them. So instead of getting um, participants to choose, I thought, why not kind of make it a bit more creative and fun and make this kind of blind date purchasing concept. So it's awesome, and uh, it's it's in a weird way it reminds me of my childhood. I. Re- I, uh, <laughs> when my grandmother was older, she lived in this, you know, like apartment complex and there was like this common library where I always feel like those libraries are filled with books that no one really ever wanted to keep on their own shelf. So there was hundreds yeah. of romance novels and I remember thumbing through them when I was like 12 with my cousins and yeah. giggling at them. Now you said something about um, collage coming together quickly sometimes and I've heard other collage artists mention this too. And I want to know what your experience is when creating collages, because for me, sometimes I will be in my studio, I'll sit down to make a collage and I will just be like going through source material, trying to make a composition. And I could just burn up hours sometimes and nothing seems to ever go together. Hmm. And other times I'll go to sit down and I'll put a couple of things together and the, the collage is done and it just yeah. feels right. Do you have, ever have an experience like that? Yeah, it's. I, I reckon it's it's partly luck, and then it's also kind of experience as, as well. So you start to get an understanding of what kind of image or what kind of paper might suit um, something else. So I guess I'm kind of talking more about the minimal uh, process, like a two-piece collage like those there where you've got one book kind of merged yeah. with another. So sometimes with that it's it's a hit or miss you can tell straight away you know because you're just placing one one object or image in front of another and you can tell 
tell immediately whether it's a success or not. But when when you're bringing in uh, more elements in play, that's when it it tends to get more subjective, doesn't it, as to whether it's a success or not. And maybe you'll be you'll be doubting yourself, and you'll have more opportunity to kind of rejig the composition. And that's when you could be spending you know hours thinking, is this right? Is this not? So the less kind of the less variables there are, the, the quicker you might get to producing an outcome. Yeah, it's like chess. You can start off with any opening, but towards the end of the game, you're very limited to what you could do to, you know, stay alive. Um, you seem yeah, to have sure. a, a really good sense of um, not only composition, color, but you seem to have a very good sense of um, how to push the, the collages, um, whether it's to print them very large and still make them look nice, like you have a picture of yourself with, I think it's like a massive P or R. Like you have a letter, you cut out like a letter from a storybook that was presumably, you know, this the size of a small breath mint and you printed it out. So it was like three or four feet tall. Yes. Exactly. It's something like this. Yeah. Like three or four feet tall. Now that must be your background. And you said you went to school for uh, graphic design. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And yes, so, your, yeah, go on. No, if you want, yes, tell more about that because I know some people always wonder, you know, should they go to school for that if they want to be an artist? And um, oh, well, you know. I still think about whether, you know, higher education, doing a degree was the right way to go, and whether I'd be in a similar situation or better if, if I had or hadn't. Um, but there's no doubt it did teach me certain formalities and kind of tricks and having a graphic design background gives you a certain kind of sensibility to, you know, um, shape, form, um, balance, hierarchy. But the, the, that's not to say that, you know, you couldn't learn that yourself doing a short course or just, you know, if you, through finding a few books or, or watching a few videos. So I wouldn't necessarily encourage anyone to, you know, attend higher education and get a huge, huge debt, but, um, no, there's, there's no doubt it's, it's taught me a few things in terms of you know, change, changing this little little letter and blowing it up large. But that, that's essentially just the tools you have, you know, having a scanner, mm -hmm. and, uh, setting the uh, DPI, the dots per inch to the scale. I mean, you must you must be you go real with, with the DPI. Do you go to like 400, 600 or something like that with your DPI? Uh, my, my standard scan is always 1200. Every scan I do. Shit. Yeah, that's, yeah a so that's a lot of dots. I mean, it may, it's a lot of dots, yeah. And it, it may only, um, you know, I might not need that ever, but at least I've, I've captured it to a size where it can, it can be enlarged. Um, but if it is to be a, a, a mural, you know, something that's over 30 square meters, then um, I scan up at 2400 DPI. Really? So you go yeah. higher or bigger even when it's something that might be seen kind of far away interesting so that, that that's the other thing as well up, the print shop guy doesn't call you and say hey our, our your file's been downloading for four hours you don't get into any trouble well, with massive files the, the the trick is you're 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 scanning it in at 2400 or 1200 but you're exporting it at a much lower number so you're not giving that printer a 2400 dpi file at 12 meters by two, that exported file is only maybe as little as 80 dots per inch. Wow. So that's, that's where the enlargement comes from, you see. So you scan something in at 2400 and then you're exporting it at 80 and that's what's then allowed for the enlargement without pixelation. Um, oh yeah, that's the reason for doing it, yes. Yeah, so when, when, when you're designing as well, it's for a mural or, or for a large letter, so that those letters you were talking about, they're for a, a, a secondhand treasure trove store in uh, in Melbourne. But you're what you're doing is you're you're kind of analysing at what uh, distance is, is it primarily being viewed at? Is it something that you're turning a page and looking at a book at, or is this something that you're trying to grab your viewer's attention from across the road? So anyone listening, if you're thinking about going to graphic design school or photography school. 
Max is the reason why maybe you would go because he knows that I'm the reason why you wouldn't because I'm supposed to know that. I went to college for photography and I completely forgot why you can go back down. I always thought, you know, bigger the better. So that's tremendous. Man. Now, when you're making, this. when you're pitching projects um, in, in graphic design, do people approach you because they see your collage work? Because one would wonder, you know, how does somebody work? How does a collage maker work with a, a brand like uh, Bombay Sapphire Gin? Because the work that you did for them was gorgeous. And I know every artist wants to know, well, how do you get a deal with a brand, right? How did that come about, if you don't mind sharing? Yeah, sure. So um, I was fortunate enough with, with Bombay to be contacted um, by Picardi. And um, initially, they were, you know, they were, they needed someone to conduct a number of uh, creative workshops for bartenders. So mm. um, they were, they were fishing around and looking for creatives that they could fly to Sydney and to Melbourne to conduct these workshops for these kind of hand-picked bartenders, the best, the best in the country. So they came to me and said, would you be interested in something like this? And by no means did they say the job is yours. It was at that point, you know, they approached me and said, you know, is this something you could do? And then from there, I, I, I threw everything at them that I could, like all my experiences through um, running collage clubs back in the UK, um, through running workshops in, in Australia, and just kind of told them all the skills I had and just, you know, just really tried to sell myself. But they, they initially came to me and I just kind of went above and beyond everything they expected. And that, then that's what led to, to on, ongoing work with them from uh, creating uh, packaging for, um, for like, limited edition uh, glasses, goblets, um, to creating, uh, you know, social content uh, beginning of this year and late last year. So it's still an ongoing collaboration, and I was fortunate enough that they came to me. And uh, the the whole reason that they found me was through um, design blogs. So I can't 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 stress that enough in terms of importance to to emerging artists is that you can't expect people just to find your page and your work. Like it needs to, it needs to be, you know, out there as as much as it can be. So, so your so some of your work was submitted to a blog and someone from Bombay mm -hmm. Sapphire was um, scrolling exactly. through there and found it. Um, yeah. Now, I was going to ask if that had anything to do with that a beautiful uh, bar you designed, you decorated. Um, that was in Australia, right? No, that was actually in um, my favorite music venue slash bar slash cafe restaurant ever. It's in, it's in Bristol, UK. Home of Banksy, Bristol, west of England. So just Place for listeners, there. if you haven't seen it yeah. before, it's, um, and please, Max, elaborate. Um, Max spent several months collaging the front of a bar um, with exactly, tiny yeah. little uh, uh, you know, pieces. And then he made origami, um, like geometric shapes, three-dimensional things, and took like, uh, play pit balls and made this uh, like <laughs> rainbow mobile mobile. I don't know what you call it um, throughout the entire ceiling of the bar as well. So it's like yes, you yeah. walk in, it's it's Max Malone's brain, right? Well, you you described it amazingly. So that's that's exactly what it is. There's this uh, kind of tapestry mosaic of images across their bar's facade, and then if you were to spin around from the bar and look to the stage. Up on the ceiling is this cosmos of, uh, of ball pit balls, ping pong balls, bouncy balls, uh, laser cut geometric shapes, origami, and even a few kind of children's uh, beautiful old vintage painted uh, wooden blocks as well. But that came three years after the success of the, the bar. So the owner. He was impressed with the, with the bar, and that's when he can't be, you know, we were hypothesizing on what the next project could be. You know, we, we'd sit, you know, having a lock-in in the bar after hours, 
gazing at the, the bar, the room, which is already covered in amazing artworks that the owner's got an amazing eye for, for talent and curated uh, musicians like atmosphere. Were you working there at the time? Just just hanging out. Um, since the success of the, the bar, we, we became close friends and we'd hang out a lot. And occasionally, uh, I, I'd live with him too when I was back in, back in town. Mm -hmm. We were looking at the ceiling, which had a few of these beautiful origami creatures on there. And um, it was his idea that why don't we kind of increase increase the volume of what's hanging from the ceiling and um, the concept grew from there where um, at one end of the room there was this beautiful kind of warm mural of kind of sun sundown colors and at the opposite end of the room was this uh, black and white more illustrative mural so the concept was to kind of merge the room together from this black and white monochrome wall to the sundown room so the uh, the objects themselves go in a gradient from from dark to purples, blues, yellows, and then eventually from oranges back to the final wall where it's reds and gold. So it kind of it flows from yeah in a gradient of, of objects too. How many pieces did you hang from the ceiling? Do you have a number? Uh, I mean, in one one square foot, you'd have you know at least ten, twelve, maybe you know, that many, and wow. It was a huge room. I mean, we kind of hypothesized that there's maybe 3,000 at least. At and least. You, you knew enough to be, document it. You took a nice video of it. Um, you Have you seen the video? I did. I watched the video. You go to the laundry mat with all the old pit balls <laughs> and you <laughs> sort them out and you're watching them and you have, you know, several washing machines uh, <laughs> pit balls. And uh, it took me a moment to understand that's what it was. I was like, is he just going to wreck all of this? What the hell is he doing? And I'm like, they must be old pit balls. And that's, that's, a, yeah. that's a brilliant hack. That's a brilliant hack. They, yeah. they, they were secondhand donated balls that were in the back of someone's garden in the UK. So covered in mud, slugs, you name it, like all overgrown. I mean, because the budget didn't really dictate that I could cover this entire music room, brand new objects. I mean, the budget was inclusive of of like what I was going to take home and what it would cost to create the artwork, you know? So there's a singular budget and I'm trying to be thrifty and make it economical for both the, the venue and the owner and myself. So that's awesome. Of the, kind of like of the a assemblage, right? It's like a, almost like a 3d collage. You're taking found objects. You mean you made a bunch yeah, sure. and you're and putting it exactly, together. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So uh, I'd highly, I'd, if, if, if there's one takeaway from any any listeners, I would I'd really recommend checking out the uh, the Galley Cosmos. I think you could hashtag Galley Galley Cosmos one word on Instagram. How do you spell um, that? That'd be G A W -L, L I C O S M O S. Galley Cosmos. That was the ceiling project, and then from there, you'll also probably see some visuals of the uh, the bar mosaic, which. I think today is still one of the projects that I'm most most proud of doing that original bar facade over around two, two months to complete. So what are some of your goals in the, in like the coming year? Oh, well, um, the, it's, it's not something I've kind of spoken about too much, but my plan is to move back to Melbourne and to find a new place to live, which will also be my workplace. I, I want to live and work under the same roof because I feel with collage, a lot of these ideas and concepts can come at any hour of the day. It's not something that with a lot of trades you can really separate. You go to work and you come back. So I feel like it needs to be under the, the one roof. Um, but on top of that, I'm, I'm saving up to uh, rent a storefront, a, a shop. Cool. So that my, my, my studio practice can be on a, um, on a street with good foot traffic and a large glass facade so that um, I can gain a bit of traction and uh, audience just through passes by as well. So the goal this year or early next is to uh, rent, a, rent a store and to um, conduct my practice from there, but to also uh, 
get the right insurance and things together to uh, start conducting uh, more regular classes, workshops, and you know, just kind of creative jam sessions within within this studio slash shop farm. That, that's so the if you're opening up a shop, how do you feel about um, artists like branching out into things like um, shirts and, and stickers and basically things other than wall art? Are you interested in um, creating uh, things like objects with your artwork on it that aren't just wall art? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've flooded with a few ideas, T-shirts, uh, puzzles. Um, I've got a button-up shirt coming out eventually with a with a shirt maker in Melbourne. Um, you know, I'm having discussions all the time with people who make products, be it candles or whether it's, you know, people who are looking for cover art. Um, but I know a lot of a lot of artists go through routes to create kind of passive revenue, you know, through a society six or a print print shop where, you know, you can apply your designs to pillowcases and shower curtains and yeah. you know coasters and beyonds and that's something that I've um I haven't delved into and I have no doubt that it would help to make a bit of money but there's there's some part of me that doesn't doesn't it doesn't quite fly with yet. I think I just need to you know maybe check in with myself and like really analyze that but I feel that there's something lost through you know, just placing a certain artwork and just letting it get produced onto mobile phone cases to, you know, everything. Sure. So, but there's no doubt that, you know, creating that, that passive income is, is a great way to monetize what often isn't necessarily that viable to do as a profession. Well, I think as, as like, you know, analog or hand cut collage artists, there's, I mean, we, we love the objects that we're cutting up, right? I imagine you get really excited when you mm -hmm. see some awesome storybooks. Like when I look at your um, collages, I think of like, you've taken all the funny little odd characters that live on the periphery of the storybooks. You know, you don't really have the main characters. You have like the weird frog or like the silly flower or like the little gemstone. So I could totally understand where you're coming from. You know, where we surround ourselves with old ephemera and this stuff isn't really being made anymore you know sure. um mm -hmm. talking about like i did just set up a printful uh store and it's a drop shipping thing and when i was like searching so, around how's it how's it going, how's it going? Um, i literally just launched it the other day I, I made one sale it was somebody that you know i knew in college thank you nicole um but the cool thing about Printful is you can like basically create the products there and, and um, input them into other uh, websites to sell. So right now it's um, plugged into my website, but with a few clicks of the buttons, I could have the same products for sale on Etsy. Mm. So um, I have that there mostly as, um, I don't want to say just in case, but maybe if someone watches like a YouTube video of mine, they go, oh, look here. And then, boom, you know, I get, you know, 30 bucks or, you know, whatever it is after all of um, the fees. The cool thing about Printful is you could set your own um, uh, prices and your, your the, the margin that you make is a little bit better than I think something like Society6. Like I have a couple of things up on Society6. and um, You might only make, honestly, like a, one, two, three dollars uh, when you mm. sell a print. But at the same time, a friend of mine recommended it because let's say you have a post that goes viral and mm. all of a sudden a thousand people want a print, they could go to Printful or Society6 and they could all get it and you don't, you know, you don't have to go um, to the post office. So that's... You don't have to do anything. It's all, all taken care of for you. Yeah, yeah. That's So that's one part. Um, but oh, you twist you twist my arm. All right then, I'm doing. No, I, <laughs> no, that wasn't my my intention at all. Um, but one thing I noticed when I was digging around online trying to figure out like what's the market for like uh, collage making, and this is a trip. 
I don't know what your uh, room looked like growing up, but my bedroom as like a teenager was covered in Rage Against the Machine and Star Wars posters and like snowboarding, skateboarding, Snap. pretty much everything. Um, and even though it's all taken down, I, I have those pictures are like burned in my mind. Now, um, young women buy collage kits, not collage kits to make like collages with. They buy loose pictures that they could hang on their wall off of uh, on, online so their rooms could look like our rooms used to when like magazines were still a thing. Wow. That's so, a thing. Yeah. And so like that seems full of these like, like it's, it's just a trip because I never would have thought of that because you know young women aren't buying yeah. magazines anymore. So, so off the shelf IKEA buy yourself a, a style and a yeah, okay. Color theme, there's pink ones, there's plant ones, there's sunset ones. Yep. Mm. There's hundreds of them. So times I wonder, are we gonna have anything to cut up in like uh tw twenty years? I don't know. So uh in interesting. This paper ephemera is it's an old thing. And just looking at something like this, the mm -hmm. 69 Valentine. Like the colors on this coffee, or I'm sorry, this ice cream and that red, like even with printing today, the, these colors, you can never make those again. You know? It's true, right? Yeah. It's an yeah, era of, of. Go ahead. Sorry. I totally agree. You're right. Yeah. There's, there's a certain kind of color and, and feel to these original books and magazines that we cut from that. It's hard to replicate, isn't it? That true kind of, that true feel of it. Do you ever find anything you can't get yourself to cut up? Uh, it's a good question. I do still have a, one or two. <laughs> There's a few kind of, but I find that once once I take the plunge and cut out one image, it's then, it, it's then fine. But um, I've tried to get into the habit more so now that I'm not just cutting out for the sake of it. It's got to be attached to a certain project or idea that I've got. There, there was a time where, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd find a beautiful, you know, ritual in just cutting out objects for the sake of it. Mm -hmm. And then maybe they would end up getting categorized and put into folders and files and so on. But these days I try to keep, keep the things within their books and, kept on their pages until, until I need them for something more specific. And I just find that way it's easier to to find that certain thing. But Yeah, I totally you know, agree. People ask me, how do you organize? Uh, the answer is I don't really. I have drawers. But then they're already organized in books, right? If I don't need it and I leave yeah. it in a book, I could kind of remember that it was in a book or a yeah. series. And just leave it there. It's, it's always fascinating to see how other people, um, you know, choose to store or use their space. I mean, the more space and the more drawers and the more table surface you've got, basically the better, but however much space you allow yourself, it's going to end up. Full. <laughs> nice. Yeah. That's, I actually, I grew up with uh, pack rats. My father was a huge collector. My uncle is a huge collector and uh, every, when the, I'm in, I'm in Buffalo, New York. So the weather is, uh, is like shit for six months out of the year. But um, as soon as it warms up, everyone goes to this outdoor flea market. And I grew up, I always had a lot of toys and things like that because they were like these $3 dinosaurs and stuff I could get at the flea market. And now yeah. I'm leaving, you know, carrying out boxes of old musty Playboys, uh, National Geographics, uh, things like that. So the, the collecting aspect is a really fun uh, part of the hobby for sure, and um, I mean, where where, where does that? Where does, <laughs> yeah, I mean, where does that sit for you? If you were to kind of break it down between the searching slash collecting, the, the cutting, the making, and then kind of the out the outcome, like what's what's kind of the the most pleasurable aspect for you? Hmm. For me, it's often the going out driving and collecting i'd say that is a that is definitely a very fun part of it um 
I guess my collecting is kind of seasonal, like I said, with the flea market mostly being open um, in the summer. So it's usually like like during the summer, especially with COVID, I, I wasn't in my studio much, but I was buying boxes and boxes, you know, at the outdoor flea market because this was a place where we could finally like, you know, go out, talk with some people and stuff. So I bought way more stuff. I barely even looked at it. Um, for me, I think there's a magic in taking apart the thing that you're cutting up. It, to me, it's almost like a, it sounds weird, but it's almost like a form of like sacrifice and like a magical ritual where I'm, I'm mm. cutting it up and I'm like, this is a beautiful book. This is like a cute picture or whatever, but like you're mine now and I'm going to transform you. I'm, I'm turning this into uh, something else. And mm. I guess my process the past couple of years is I've been more interested in the ideas and it's like, I've been trying to solve different philosophical problems in my head, um, putting it together. And I reached a point where I'm like, you know, that, okay, I've, you've said it, you've done it, you're over it. Now I just want to make things that are like very uh, fun and, and colorful and, and strange. I think, I think that does enough for people, you know, rather than trying to guess what type of philosophy I'm trying to unpack from, um, you know, metaphysical things that I'm thinking about when I'm looking at them. So um, I think the magic is in the composition because you're taking things and making new relationships with them. So I guess, I guess that's my favorite part. Yeah. So I don't know what time you have left. Um, one thing I did wanted to ask, I did want to ask you earlier when we were talking about the music festivals i slowly started to realize some of my most favorite bands that i've been listening to over the past couple of years that spotify has been feeding me are from australia you have tame impala the psychedelic, yeah. the psychedelic porn crumpets the babe rainbow and king gizzard and the lizard wizard yeah <laughs> those are fantastic bands and i'm wondering like What's is there a vibe going on in Australia? Are people kind of celebrating this vintage like psychedelia? Well, I've just just the last few days I've been really getting into uh dope lemon, so definitely give dope lemon, lemon? a spin. Dope okay. lemon, yeah, um, okay. <laughs> um, I'd love to create some artwork for dope lemon, but that. Yeah, I just think there's a certain culture here in Australia. There's a certain pace of life. And I think generally people are very happy and positive out here, quite laid back. And I think it's, it is just a good, a good cocktail and melting pot of kind of attitudes and, and lifestyle. And people have got it, generally speaking, like there's a good, very good quality of life out here. And I think it's just, it is just a breeding ground for amazing music and sounds and, and artists. You mentioned um, psychedelic porn crumpets. I'll have to give a shout out to my friend uh, Jordan Martin back in the UK who I went to school with, but uh, he's produced a couple of their music videos actually. I oh, nice. Using a kind of a, a collage aesthetic. Cool. Um, oh. And then back to, back to Tame, Tame Impala. I remember uh, first hearing his music and the aesthetic of the covers as well. That was an amazing artist who's based in uh, in the UK, but he might be Australian. I think I don't can't quite pronounce his name. His name's Leaf. Leaf Leaf, Leaf Pajowski. He's an amazing <laughs> designer. He does amazing record covers. And then you mentioned King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. Yes. I mean that again, like the amount of kind of genres that they'll smash together and, and experiment with, like hugely inspiring. That like, music for me is is synonymous with, with, with making. Um, there was an album that came out, was it this year or last year that I was really anticipating? That was uh, The Avalanches. The Avalanches? with them? No. I'm, I'm not I'm familiar right with The Avalanches. Right here. <laughs> okay, so I... I've actually credited them and met, wrote to them before that as a, you know, a 10 year old kid first hearing the avalanches kind of opened my ears, eyes and mind to 
to what what you are allowed to do in terms of you know mixing and chopping things together from disparate places mm -hmm. the avalanche is you know their original records were you know just sampling from everywhere like without without hesitation without licensing mm -hmm. but creating the most amazing sounds and um so yeah to this day i, I still recall first hearing the Australian band The Avalanches and how they would chop and slice music together and I found that hugely inspiring as, a, as an artist. You ever heard, I've heard someone say uh, hip-hop is a collage and if you think about it like there's, if you think about like living in a city where you're standing there you'll hear someone else's music in a car, you'll hear like a window air conditioning unit, you'll hear somebody talking you'll hear a siren, you hear all these different sounds at once. Um, have you ever heard the Beastie Boys album, Paul's Boutique? Yes, yeah. That's sprout, that's if, if that's my like desert, desert island pick. I'll definitely, um, I definitely should give that. I've been, I've been listening to um, a lot of podcasts with uh, Rick Rubin lately. Nice. The producer, mm -hmm. like his, his, his conversations he's having with, you know, hip hop pioneers and you know just the way he he goes about what he does and he had an he actually mentioned something which would be kind of cool cool thing to end on potentially but uh mm -hmm. he said that he really loves listening to artists who are producing music not necessarily with an informed uh genre or background so what i'm trying to say is that like you know they might be making a hip hop record but their background isn't necessarily purely from hip hop they've they've also been you know interested in in other genres so sure that's the amazing thing about collage is that you know we've all got access to whatever materials are at our disposal but no two people are going to create the create the same thing so you know a bit like how producers you know you know he he worked with Johnny Cash and all kinds of amazing artists not necessarily because he was the best in that particular genre, but just because you know he had a certain inclination to try things and to mix styles and techniques together. And I think that's what's amazing with with collage and why I still find it fascinating and love this community and follow amazing people like yourselves because we're all going about a medium with our own interpretation, style and approach. It's true. And it, it, I'm, I'm sure... I have seen and you have seen uh you'll look at um a collage artist account and you're like oh i've used that picture before or i've seen that picture yeah, I yeah, know yeah. What issue that's in and this person's yeah. used it in a way that i never would have thought of you know totally. really yeah so yeah, Matt, is. thank you so much for being on the show um is there anything you want to plug um anyone listening do you want them to you know check out your instagram page any projects you want them to look into yeah, I have, um, I've got something in the works right now that I'm really excited to to share. Um, I don't want to give away the collaborator yet. I want to sort of wait for a full reveal, but it is um, it is a collaborator in the States, um, and it's something I'm really um, excited to share. But overall, i just say i um, love to give me a follow on Instagram. Uh, the name is at maximilian.malone, or it's quicker just to hashtag Max Malone, one word, M-A-X-M-A-L-O-N-E. So yeah, just find me on socials and say hello. I'd love to, you know, if anyone does listen and found this of any use or interest, do do say hello. And yeah, thanks so much for uh, choosing me for this first Cut It Out episode. That's really kind of you. Thanks again, man. I, I had to have you here and thank you so much for, for joining. It's awesome. Oh, my pleasure. Nice to chat. We'll do it again. All right, man.